Well, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's a chance for Senator Kane and I to bring you up to date on what's taken place here uh, on the health care issue in, in this last week. Uh, yesterday, I think Virginians and Americans got at least a brief reprieve from what was, in my, at least in my tenure in the Senate, maybe one of the worst pieces of legislation I've ever seen. Legislation that would have provided a, an enormous tax break for the wealthiest of Americans, but at the price of 22 million Americans losing their health insurance. And both of us as former governors, uh, something that would have dramatically altered Medicaid. Uh, over $770 billion of cuts to Medicaid, a lot of that cost shifting back to states in a way that would have really seriously harmed Virginia, which runs a very frugal Medicaid program. So the battle's not over, uh, but uh, we wanted to be able to chance to convey to you some of our concerns with this legislation and the hope that we'll be able to move to a better spot where we could actually start bipartisan conversations. But with that, I'd like Tim to make some comments, then we'll be happy to take your questions. Well, thanks, Mark. And you know, Mark is on the Finance Committee, which is the committee in the Senate that oversees Medicaid and Medicare. And I'm on the Health, Education, Labor, Pension Committee that oversees all other health care matters. And this is very important to us in the work that we do here. Uh, as Mark said, this bill was very, very tough, especially on states like Virginia. The Medicaid cuts were the thing that really jumped out because while the House went after the Medicaid expansion under the Affordable Care Act, the Senate went beyond that to try to propose dramatic cuts to the core Medicaid program. In Virginia, 60% of Medicaid recipients are children, about 20% are people with disabilities, 10 to 15% are, are parents and grandparents in nursing homes. And so when you take that much out of Medicaid, uh, you hurt the most vulnerable people and it's sort of offset by giving a tax cut to the wealthiest. Um, you would have seen that loss of coverage, 22 million people, premiums going up for seniors, some very bad stuff. And, and the bill was bad because the process was bad. Um, there was a decision by the Republicans to do this only with Republican votes, to craft it in secret, uh, to not engage either of the committees that have jurisdiction over this matter, to not have hearings so that the public could come forward and share what they thought needed to be fixed about the current system. So it's my hope by, by getting this delay, We'll go back to our states next week during the 4th of July. We'll hear from constituents. We'll come back. And I hope the Republicans are committed to a full process where they put these bills before committee, where we can actually hear from citizens and then work in a bipartisan way to improve health care. We've got to meet President Trump's promises. Nobody can lose coverage. Nobody can pay more. Nobody gets kicked around because of pre-existing conditions. And he also promised he wouldn't cut Medicaid. I'll, I'll vote for any bill that meets those promises, but I'm going to be a really hard sell on a bill that shatters those promises. And with that, glad to open it up and take your questions. as we go now. Well, Senators, I'll jump in. It's Mike down at Channel 13 in Norfolk. Hey, Mike. Uh, Washington hey. Post right now is reporting that Senate Majority Leader McConnell is aiming to send a revised version of his health care bill to the CBO as soon as tomorrow. Are you guys hearing anything about any revisions that might make it any more palatable? Well, Mike, this is exactly the problem. If there's a revised bill from yesterday, it's still building off of this base bill that provides tax cuts for the wealthy, really hurts Medicaid, lays 22 million people off. I don't think tweaks to this bill that is frankly being done in secret. Um, your news is breaking news, at least to me. I didn't know there was any revision uh, in place. Uh, but that's what's wrong, as Tim has indicated, with this whole process. Open it up, let sunlight in. Let Virginians come in who receive Medicaid payments. Let folks come in who would, might lose coverage. Let senators hear their voices before they draft something new. And, and I agree, Mike. You know, Mar Mark and I both in the last week had some really important hearings and roundtables with Virginia constituents, parents of kids with disabilities, uh, folks who have family members who need uh, skilled nursing care. Uh, we've heard from doctors, for example, a huge percentage of the childbirths in Virginia are paid for by Medicaid, mm -hmm. and we're hearing about the effects this would have. Th they've been changing the bill twice in the Senate. Now, this would be, I mean, twice in the House, this would be version three in the Senate. Whenever they're done changing it, they need to put it out so that the public can see it and we can hear what's good, what's bad, what needs to be fixed. But trying to change it and tweak it and then jam it through 
doesn't respect the public, and it's almost a guarantee, even if they pass it, that they would end up hurting a lot of people. And I, <clears throat> I just want to add also, I know Tim had a roundtable in Richmond. I had a, a group of folks um, come up to my offices here to hear some of these families. There was a, a lady from Virginia Beach. Her son was about 15. He'd been waited 10 years to get one of these Medicaid waivers. Mm -hmm. And those waivers that provide that support for disabled children, disabled adults, uh, to allow their parents to go ahead and lead full lives. I mean, she was crying in my office. I don't know how any senator could look at her and say this plan, which would so savage Medicaid, uh, that they vote for after they heard those kind of stories. Senators, this is Bill Bartell, the Virginian pilot. I, I have two questions for you, one about the Republicans, one about the Democrats. What you were just talking about, Senator Warner and Senator Kane mentioned, too, that the degree that this hurts people from your point of view, do you, really, are, do you see the Republican colleagues in the Senate and maybe in the House just really being heartless about this? They just don't seem to care about people? Do you, is that how you feel about that? And that, that's one question. The other is about the Democrats. There's been a lot of conversation about this plan, the specifics of it. There have been Kaisers who put it up against the existing Obamacare to compare the differences. What we haven't seen, except there's been a case like Senator Kane introduced a bill to make some changes in the marketplace. But there hasn't been a specific Democratic, this is what we do to improve Obamacare plan. Do you, do you all see the Democrats need to do that to bring some clarity to this? So no. Republicans and then no, your side. Right mm -hmm. um, well, let me just tackle the Democratic part of it, Bill. Look, um, Senator Warner and I both signed on to a number of bills to make improvements to the health care system in previous years that didn't ever see light of day in committees. But we have been on board to try to make improvements. The other side has kind of had the attitude, we don't want to improve it because we hope to kill it. But we've been out with bills that we think are good problem-solving bills. Um, you know, my story, I got on the HELP Committee this year on the 3rd of January, and within two days, I wrote a letter, had 13 senators, including Senator Warner, we all joined together, wrote a letter to our, the two key committee chairs and Senator McConnell, we said, look, if you want to sit down, we are ready to work with you right now. We have plenty of ideas. I put in a bill about reinsurance. There's other bills we've introduced in the past. But here's what's happened. Uh, on the HELP committee where I serve, we've had committees, we've had hearings about all kinds of things, but there's only one taboo subject. We're not allowed to have a hearing about the health care bill. We couldn't have one about the House version. We've not been able to have one about the Senate version. This is how you hear from people. You put them at a witness table and let them share their experiences, and then Democrats have a chance to call up bills or amendments that they propose. We've been waiting for this, but, but now we understand what's going on because Yesterday, Mitch McConnell uh, told his Republican colleagues, it was in the Hill this morning, look, we've got to do this ourselves or we will have to work with Democrats. This whole thing has been trying to shut the door and have meetings without Democrats involved. But when you lock us out, you're also locking out the American public. You're locking out Virginians and they got a lot to say about their health care. So open up the door, let the sun shine in, let the Senate be the Senate, the great deliberative body that it is. Work in the committees. These are Republican-led committees. It's not like we can buffalo through things that are just Democratic bills. The only way either Mark or I could get any amendment through in our committees is by convincing Republicans it's a good idea. What are they afraid of? That we'll come up with an idea that would improve health care? They need to let the sun shine into this process and hear from the public. And let me just echo one. Tim's got a really good bill that I support about reinsurance that would help bring premium costs down. I've been working on some legislation as long as there are consumer protections that would allow sale of insurance policies across state lines. I've had legislation in the past that would offer a cheaper plan. You know, in the current uh, exchanges, you've got gold, silver, bronze. We had a plan that would offer a copper plan that might be cheaper for um, younger people to buy into. So we've got some really good ideas. Matter of fact, both of us are going to be on the floor of the Senate mm -hmm. later today talking about some of those ideas. But the second day of the session, the Republicans decided they were going to use this process called reconciliation, which allows them to pass a bill with only 51 votes. They got 52 senators. They figured they could get 51 of them to go along, and they've basically not included uh, any ideas or wanted any input from the Democrats. I hope after the fiasco of this week and the kind of universal rejection of their current proposal that they'd come back and 
restart the process and do this in a way that gets full airing. And to the, early, the other question about the Republicans, no, I don't think our Republican colleagues are heartless. I, I, I think, frankly, they rushed through this so much that I don't think they probably have had the chance to sit down with the kind of families that we sat down with because I don't see how any representative could sit down with mm -hmm. these families who've worked so hard to try to get their disabled child or their disabled adult who's now working and, uh, and have the kind of support so the parents can continue working that you could vote for legislation that would frankly take that kind of benefit away from those kind of families. I just, I don't believe that if, if they had the chance to sit down with those families. Senator Kane, you agree? Um, I, I do. Look, I think that there's, um, these stories are really tough. They're very, very tough. Um, you know, when parents tell you, I, I had a mom with three kids, single mom with three kids, and one has autism, and she was talking about the difficulty of being a single mom, single mom with three kids, but especially the challenges of this teenage child with autism, and she said, wow, I never would have imagined that I would be a parent of a disabled child, and until I was, I had no idea, no idea how all-consuming this is, but now that I'm here, I'm at the very edge of what I can do, and if these Medicaid supports are pulled out, I don't know what's going to happen to me. I don't know what will happen to my child with autism, but the other kids either. And you hear these stories, and, and I go back to the promises that President Trump made. He said again and again, nobody's going to pay more, nobody's going to lose coverage, nobody's going to get kicked around because of pre-existing condition. I'm the only one on the stage that will tell you I won't cut Medicaid. I, if we can just hold him to his promises, I'm glad to sign a bill that meets President Trump's promises, but I'm sure not going to go for a bill that shatters his promises. And, and I'm, we're both really anxious to see a bill that meets all his promises or, or any close to it, even yeah. close to it. Yeah. Uh, this is Nick Benton of Falls Church News for us. Hey, Nick. What do you, hey, what do you um, see happening if the bill just doesn't uh, get introduced, if things just stay the same? What, what's going to be the consequence? Well, Nick, there are, are a series of things we need to do, you know, short of major surgery, to make sure the, ex the exchanges stay viable, relevant, and that people have choices. Tim's bill in terms of reinsurance, so there's a backstop for really very serious high expense costs. Um, is a really good idea about bringing premiums down. The idea that the making sure that the bill's enforcement of the individual mandate is that the Trump administration is actually going to enforce that is really important to make sure that there's enough, particularly younger people, that go ahead and buy insurance so that the insurance companies can then lower their rates because they're going to figure they're going to have a bigger pool. There are some other issues around cost sharing that, that the administration has been reluctant to basically just follow the law. So if we can, if the administration will follow the existing law and we can do a little bit of surgery like Tim's bill and others, that will help ensure greater competition within the exchanges, but it'll also give us a little time for us to go back and say, all right, let's take a deep breath and say, all right, where did we get it right with Obamacare? Where do we mean, need to make more major changes? And I'm welcome to, ha to have that conversation, but we got to start with the premise that you're not going to start with a bunch of tax cuts and you're not going to start by savaging Medicaid before we start those dis discussions. And Nick, you're a, a good student of the process here. I mean, however far they get on the bill, if they can't take it further, Again, what's wrong with sending it to the finance and the help committees? My committee chair, Lamar Alexander, was a governor of Tennessee before he was in the Senate, and he knows what Medicaid is. He knows how critical Medicaid is to a state. He was the president of the University of Tennessee. They had a medical school. They had a hospital. They had physician practice groups. He well understands the human consequences of this, and I'm convinced that he and other members of the committee um, who've been there a long time and have a lot of expertise would love to get into the rolling up our sleeves and finding the solutions that can improve health care. If we can do some things to stabilize it right now, then we can have a serious deliberation over other things we can do together to improve health. And everybody will benefit. And then the Dems and Republicans can fight about who gets credit. It seems now it's just going to be one side's going to try to do it. And, and if that's the case, we won't solve this problem. And frankly, a lot of my Republican colleagues have said, you know, they understand that trying to do this with only Republican votes is both bad policy and bad politics. 
and particularly when you had a bill as draconian as what came out. So I, I think a lot of them would love to love to see an open mm -hmm. process where we can all own it together and try to work actually towards a successful outcome. Senator Warner, one more question. Okay. First answer. Mm -hmm. Senator Warner, it's Anthony McGee from NBC-owned television station. has got a couple of questions for you. Uh, you said in today's Senate Intel hearing that you've asked 21 U.S. states to make public information about efforts to hack their election systems. Could you detail your motivation behind that request? Do you think some states, particularly red states, aren't taking the hacking seriously? That's my first question. And second question is, what steps, if any, has Facebook taken since the election when it comes to policing fake news? Great, great questions. First of all, one of the concerns we have is that the 21 states may not know that they were actually hacked because DHS said last week that in some cases they contacted the the Secretary of State. In some cases they simply contacted the owner of the voter file, the vendor. So I'm not trying to embarrass any state, but I do want every Secretary of State and local registrars to know that that while the Russians didn't change any vote totals in 2016, they will be back. They'll be back in 2018, and frankly, what we're both afraid of is they'll be back in 2017. So we need a much more concerted effort to get this information out, and so far DHS has been saying all the states are victims, so it's up to them to be willing to come forward. Well, if, they don't, if the elected officials don't even know, how will they come forward? We're trying to work that through. On the second issue, you know, I was very concerned about Facebook's reaction after our election. So much fake news flooding through Facebook, fl flooding through Twitter. And at first, Facebook, in, effect, in a sense, blew it off. They have changed. We had testimony this morning that in France, Facebook worked with the French and took down 30,000 fake accounts right before the election so that the Russians couldn't use these fake accounts, usually created as bots, to in effect overwhelm the search engine and get out Russian-sponsored fake news that might have elected, might have changed the French election. So we need to see this same collaboration now, Facebook, Google, Twitter, with all these platform companies going forward so we'll have a, a safer system and a more informed electorate as we go into 2017 and 2018. All right. Thank you, guys. We appreciate you for joining. Thank you. Thanks, guys.